Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Coffee Science Seminar. Uh, today's talk uh, is by Professor Tim. He's going to talk about Merritt's disease. Uh, I am Karishma. I'm a research fellow and I closely work with Nina and Tim between the Center of Horticulture and Animal Science. Uh, as we start the talk, first, I would like to acknowledge the country. The University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and the global society. So just a bit of housekeeping. Today's talk is going to be for about 45 to 50 minutes. And if you have any questions, please type it in the Q&A tab, not in the chat function. And uh, yeah, we'll have, we'll hold the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Tim. Off to you, Tim. Thank you, Krishna. Hey, I assume that's all okay. So thanks everyone for um, coming to my seminar today. Uh, as Krishna said, we'll have hopefully have a Q&A at the end of the session, although I have another meeting to go to, um, which first one for a year and a half is actually going to be in person. So I actually have to leave um, a bit earlier than I otherwise would have. So if I can't answer your questions then, um, feel free to contact me and I'll so today, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm going to talk about a disease called Marek's disease. It's a disease of poultry or chickens primarily. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of is it a good uh, animal model for imperfect vaccines? So hopefully the reasons why will become clear as we go through my talk today. I too would have liked to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and the custodianship of the land and pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country and recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society and our opportunity to contribute to that. So an outline of my talk today, a little bit of basic herpes virus biology, so virology 101. I'll then describe the disease of interest, which is Marek's disease, and then talk about what's happened in the past uh, 40 to 50 years of use of vaccination um, to control Marek's disease, and then go a little bit into how, why, and how and why we describe those as imperfect vaccines and what that might mean for us today. So the herpes viruses are a large family of viruses. So most mammals and birds um, have at least one herpes virus, and they also extend into other um, other animals such as reptiles and even mollusks have um, herpes virus as well. So there's a quite a good example of that in Victoria where an abalone herpes virus is spread from Western Victoria right across the southern coast line um, through to the west coast of Tasmania. They're an envelope virus and as you can see, okay, yes. um, so this is the envelope here. So that surrounds the virus and that's essential for infectivity. Uh, they are relatively large for viruses, so between 120 to 150 nanometers in diameter. They have a consistent and regular shape, so icosahedral with a polyhedron, polyhedron uh, 20 triangular faces. And so this is this structure that we see here in the electron microarray. They have a double-stranded genome, and I guess that's important in the context of herpes viruses, because that makes them much more genetically stable than other families of viruses which you might be interested. They replicate in the nucleus of cells that they infect. And uh, important or defining features of the herpes viruses, so they're relatively fragile viruses. So they're readily inactivated. So they're similar to COVID-19 COVID virus. That envelope uh, is, is membranous from the cells that they've infected. And that's readily inactivated or deactivated by things like detergents 
uh, drying out that tend to make these viruses become non-infectious. As a consequence, they don't really last very long in the environment. So, um, but Marix is actually an exception to that, and I'll describe why that a bit later on. But as a consequence of this poor environmental stability, then transmission generally requires very close contact between animals um, for it to occur. So between the mother and her offspring, uh, venereal transmission is quite common for the herpes viruses, as is crowded conditions. So things like feedlots and other intensive production systems. And another virus that my group works on, which is bovine herpes virus, which many of you will have heard me talk about in the past, uh, is intricately involved in bovine respiratory disease with feedlot cattle. So that's for another day. But there are exceptions to these generalized properties, and Marrick's disease uh, is probably one of those big exceptions. So now a little bit about herpes viruses and new. So um, as I said before, most species of mammals have at least one herpes virus. And as humans, there are at least eight known herpes viruses that infect us. And some of us will be thinking, well, it doesn't really affect me, but I guess I'll make a case in the next couple of minutes that that's probably not true, even if you don't know about it. So the two most common ones are herpes virus simplex one and two. So herpes virus 1 is the one that's commonly associated with uh, cold sores. And then herpes virus, human herpes virus 2 or simplex 2 is, also, is involved primarily in sexually transmitted diseases. We then have varicella zoster virus or chickenpox. So many of you would have had chickenpox as a, as a child. Uh, and so these are probably the three most common or most overt um, herpes virus that infect humans. But by and large, these viruses have co-evolved with us as a species. So they don't cause, typically cause really severe disease. And so unless you have an underlying complication, then you're unlikely to die from a herpes virus um, infection or even have severe disease as a consequence of the herpes virus infection. Now this model of um, virus coast co-evolution is exemplified by uh, type 8, which is uh, human herpes virus 8 or uh, Kaposi sarcoma virus. So this virus um, infects probably 100% of the adult human population, but we didn't know about it really until the advent of um, the AIDS virus in the 80s. And people that were unfortunate enough to get that infection um, because their immune systems were so um, depleted, then the human herpes virus 8 emerged uh, and was able to um, cause uh, associated cancer. But otherwise, these viruses tend to be or can be quite benign. Clinically. So as I said before, um, some things you might not know about yourself. Um, so some people will know that they suffer from or get cold sores periodically, as I do. And but the reality is that most of us are probably infected with this virus uh, in some time in the past. And you can see there the percentages of seropositive, so indicating they have been exposed to the virus, increases as we get older. Uh, and with, when we get to um, over, the, over 50 years of age, then almost everybody is going to have the seropositive for this virus, indicating they have that infection. So simplex virus one and two are quite closely related genetically and antigenically, but they have very different um, clinical distributions. So herpes virus one or cold sore virus is generally transmitted by close contact. And so that might be between parents and children. Uh, and, but it also does this a little bit more stable in the environment than HSV one. As a consequence, there is some environmental persistence and mechanical transmission. In somewhat, in somewhat, in some contrast, HSV2 uh, doesn't have, it's much more unstable in the environment. And that's probably why it's more commonly associated uh, with sexual transmission. But I guess that distinction uh, is purely, uh, can be, they can switch around as well. So probably the, the defining feature of the herpes virus family is latency, to form latency and then reactivate. So latency is a state in which the virus resides in our cells, um, but is not active. 
So it's just sitting there and waiting. And then as a consequence of uh, various stimuli, it then undergoes a process called reactivation, whereby it moves from that dormant state to become, once more, become uh, infectious. Now you can see in this diagram here, we have a pictorial example of these features. So here, uh, in this case, it's HSV1 again. So this might be on the epithelial cells of the lips. So a person might have a cold sore. And then once that cold sore starts to resolve, the virus actually enters the nerve endings associated with that tissue. And they travel down the axon to the nerve cell bodies, and then they reside there in that latent state. And so there, in, for most viruses, uh, this means there's very little gene activity and certainly no translation of actual viral proteins. So from that perspective, the virus is invisible to our immune system. Later on, as uh, this process is all the processes that stimulate this are, are still poorly, poorly characterized, the virus undergoes reactivation. So as a consequence of stimuli, it moves back down the uh, axon and out of the nerve endings to infect the um, surrounding cells of the epithelial cells and once more become produce infectious virus that can be then transmitted. As a consequence of this process, this is why uh, if you do get cold sores, you'll probably commonly get them in very similar spots because the virus is using the same uh, axons um, to access that, that tissue. So, so for the cold sore virus or HSV1, where that virus resides is actually in a nerve cell body at the base of your brain um, called the trigeminal ganglia, uh, which is pictured here. And you can see here that there's various nerve or axons that actually travel to the tissues where you're most likely to be um, get a cold sore developed. So, and in contrast, one of the other herpes viruses that infects humans was the chickenpox virus or the varicella zoster virus. Uh, it's unusual in that we get one presentation in children. So this is called, classically called chickenpox. Now, unlike the cold sore virus, it doesn't reside in the trigeminal ganglia. It resides in the sacral ganglia in the nerves, uh, in the cell bodies within the spine. Now, later on in life, it's, uh, this chickenpox virus is unusual because it then undergo reactivation, so the same process as, as the herpes virus one, but it a very long time interval. So this could be 50 or 60 years in some people um, to make to cause what we know, what we call as shingles uh, on the, usually on the torso. It has a very different clinical presentation and we don't really understand why that's the case. Um, but I guess the, the reality is that once you've had a herpes virus infection, it's going to reside with you for life. And it's either in the base of your brain or in the, the uh, cell bodies of your spine. So there's something to think about, not in time sleep. As someone I once worked, well, worked with said, they're not the most dangerous viruses in the world, but they're certainly the most loyal. So on to the topic today, which is another herpes virus, which as I said before, primarily infects chickens, called Mar and the disease it causes is called Marek's disease. It's named after the person that first described it in 1907. And between 1907 and the early 60s, it was a fairly mild disease um, of chickens. However, in the 1960s, it began to what we might describe as re-emerge as actually a clinical syndrome. And in that process, it actually had quite a different presentation. So rather than the polyneuritis, which was inflammation of the nerves, it also had that as well as a neoplastic transformation of T cells, or as we might commonly call it, a cancer associated with it. Now, these, uh, these proliferations or lesions could also occur not only in the nerve tissue, but they also would spread to the, the other organs, such as the spleen and the liver. At this time point, it had a very high case fatality rate. So some strains of the virus, so that case fatality is so if, um, if you get 10 infections, and 60%, six of those die, then the case fatality rate would be about 60%. And so as a consequence of that, it really did threaten 
the uh, intensification of um, the chicken industry. However, soon after the emergence, or probably 10 or so years after the emergence of this free, a different sort of clinical presentation, um, there were vaccines developed that controlled um, Marrick's disease. And this is actually the first cancer vaccine um, that we described. I guess this is going to be the main sort of topic we talk about today. However, not following on not, not long after that was the emergence of strains which actually overcame the um, protective effects of the vaccine and were able to cause uh, the cancer associated with Marrick's disease as well. And again, we'll talk more in depth about that today. All right. Oh, good. Sorry about that. So, a model of Marrick's disease or Marrick's disease virus infection. So, there's really two components to that. The one is what we might describe as a typical virus replication cycle. So, the bird gets infected, the virus replicates, it undergoes latency because it's a herpes virus, and then undergoes reactivation. Uh, and so that's sort of a typical type of herpes virus. Infection. The second part of Marek's disease is, is atypical, and that is because it is a transformation or developed, de developing into a cancer. Now, as we can see here, another one of the key features about Marek's disease is that it has the capacity to persist in the, in the production environment. And we think that the main mode of infection of birth is that they inhale um, dust in the production environment. And then once that's inhaled, it actually is engulfed by macrophages in the lung. And then it's only when once it's in the macrophages does the virus actually become infectious. So between it being in the production virus and being in the macrophages, there's actually very or very little or no opportunity for us to intervene in terms of protecting chickens. So we'll keep that in mind for, for as we don't move on today. So once the virus is in the macrophages and becomes infectious, they move into the uh, immune associated organs, such as the thymus, and therefore, and then the virus is transferred uh, intracellularly into naive B cells. And so those B, fell, B cells uh, are then destroyed. So there's a very uh, strong association of immunosuppression with, Mar suppression with Marrick's disease viruses. And the B cells that do survive then go on to transfer uh, the infection to activate T cells. So at this is, and this is the junction point between the atypical and the typical um, phase of Marrick's disease virus infection. So some of those T, T cells may then undergo transformation and, and form the tumors that we talked about before. In other T cells, the virus will be, undergo a latent phase, so that latency. It then, they will then move throughout the body, and when they arrive at the feather follicles in the skin, they, the virus undergoes reactivation and infects the, the epithelial cells of the feather follicle. And once that occurs, then those cells then produce new virus, which is shed off in the dark, in the, uh, the skin material that's, that is shed off through the, from the skin. And that is actually the infectious um, component of Marrick's disease. And so that then contaminates the, the uh, production environment with the virus. And that can be very, very difficult um, to remove that. Uh, those infectious particles. And in fact, a, a colleague of ours at the University of New England, they actually use this, collect this dust, and then use that as their challenge material uh, in vaccine studies. So, so what are these viruses that I'm talking about? So there's a family of viruses which we have historically referred to as the Marrick's disease viruses. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's only one virus though, Marrick's disease virus one, uh, or gallant herpes virus 2, which causes Marrick's disease. So it's associated with these enlarged nerves and the lesions that form in the visceral organs. There's a second virus that also infects chickens, 
very closely related to the virus that causes Marek's disease, um, but doesn't have the capacity to cause the cancer because it doesn't have, it lacks the oncogenes responsible for that. Sorry, associated with that. There's also a third virus, Marek's disease virus three, which is actually a herpes virus of turkeys that, we, that is not associated with any diseases in turkeys um, or chickens, but acts as a good vaccine for Marek's disease because uh, while they're all these viruses genetically distinct, they are antigenic related. So if we vaccinate a chicken with um, HBT, then it will protect against some strains of Marek's disease one that actually causes um, the cancer. Now, all of these virus establish what we might describe as persistent infections in that they will all travel to the feather follicle uh, and be shed off uh, at the feather follicle epithelium. And that's another important feature on a parent. So Marek's disease is what I often describe as a vicious cycle. So we have a virus that is persistent in the introduction environment, it's infectious in the production environment, for periods of weeks and sometimes up to years. If you then reintroduce an unvaccinated flock, then some strains of the virus will cause up to 60% mortality within a few weeks. And there's probably strains that are circulating, uh, particularly in North America, where this, this fatality can be much higher and much quicker. And I'll see some examples of that a little bit later. However, if we vaccinate the flock with, here with HVT or one of the other um, viruses, then we prevent the tumor formation and we prevent this mortality. However, vaccination doesn't interrupt, completely interrupt that infectious replication and shedding cycle. So as a consequence, we still end up with environmental persistence of the, um, the viruses that cause disease in the production environment. And so it's this circular, circularization of this in vaccination infection model We'll talk about today in terms of the context of infection vaccination. So, as I said before, the Marek's disease itself really emerged as a real problem in the in the sixties, and then not, so we might say, around about about here. So, around about the time that um, chicken production was beginning to be intensified in North America, and the viruses that started to present with the, the with the capacity to cause tumors. Um, are what we would describe in today as virulent Marek's disease viruses. So they've, they've developed the capacity to cause this more clinically overt disease. But around about that time, HVT was discovered, and then uh, MD, the Marek's disease virus, two virus as well. And they discovered that if you, vaccinate, if you vaccinated birds with HVT, you protected against the tumor forming, but not replication and transmission. So similarly, uh, vaccinating with MDD2, you get the same process. Now, after approximately 10 or 15 years, they had breakthrough in that, those protective effects of vaccination. So even though they'd received either HBT or MDD2, MD then they were getting tumours um, that coming through. So we're getting this breakthrough of um, protection. At that stage, they decided, okay, well, what if we combine the HVT and with MDV2, so we produced this bivalent vaccine, and again that then protected against the tumor formation, um, but did not protect against replication and transmission of the virulent viruses that were shipped in the production environment. And then lo and behold, not long after, or another 10 years after that, then the same process happened. So we had viruses emerge that were able to come overcome the protective effects of the very virulent viruses, as we call them, as VB viruses. And at that stage, a, another vaccine had been, a potential vaccine had been identified, which we know as Lispins or CBI 988. And this is a, uh, an attenuated version of MDV1 um, that is able to protect against these very virulent type viruses. And so we, and so this is where we are now in that we have, so RISPINS is still widely used throughout the world. Uh, it protects against these VVV plus viruses. It prevents 
in terms of it prevents disease, but it does not prevent replication, totally prevent replication and transmission of the virus. So in this, what we call the Bob Witter model, so he was the time states that first developed this model, then at some time in the future, arguably we could say we're probably overdue for it. We've missed a couple of steps in Bob's ladder. Um, for a generation four wild type virus, oops, um, that our current vaccines would not be able to protect against in terms of tumor formation. Now, the issue with that is that if that was to occur today, we don't have the vaccines um, to protect against those. So this is a question that we began to address several, a number of years ago. So this is another demonstration of this evolution of the virulence of these um, MDV strains. You can see here the impacts of the different virulence types. I'm just going to move the Christian eye out of the way so I can see the slides. Uh, we can see the impact on, on the organ, organs of the birds which are affected um, by the viruses uh, and really associated with the severe immunosuppression. So, of course, associated with that was the trying to understand what was driving or what was the molecular basis for this virulence. When we look at... When we look at the these viruses with different virulence uh, in terms of just their pure genetic sequence, they sequence the genomes of these viruses, they all still, still look very similar. So it's not about overt changes in the structural proteins of these viruses, it's something else that's driving this virulence. And we probably still don't really understand this process to this day. However, some groups have associated that <clears throat> The expression of some microRNAs in these viruses actually do help explain some of this variability um, between virulence and the viscerical one virus. And you can see here we have our very virulent, these examples of very virulent viruses and very virulent plus viruses. And we can see differential, differential, differential expression of um, some of these microRNAs. And in particular, um, we'll explore microRNA4. Um, There's just a bit of a technical error. Tim, mm. will you join back again? Bear with him, please. <laughs> 
Well, that was exciting, wasn't it? <laughs> Um, for... I wouldn't call it exciting. <laughs> I don't know where I was up to when I went offline, but anyway. So we had we still have thirty one participants back on, so you can continue now, please, Tim. Radio. Sorry about that, everyone. I'm not sure what happened there. I lost uh, internet access by the LANs network. So I'm currently now connected by Wi-Fi. So I'm not sure where I was up to, but I'll start from here. So the, the microRNA myth uh, M4, which is expressed by the very virulent types in a differential manner, is also has a, is a homologue of a host microRNA MIF 55 and which is also implicated in several cancers. And then Carposi sarcoma virus also expresses a homologue of the 55. So Venu Nears group in the Nears group in the US, sorry, in the UK, have shown that if they uh, knock out the all of these microRNAs, they're all from one transcript, that the virus doesn't doesn't have any effect on the capacity of the virus to replicate. Uh, and you don't but you don't get Marx disease either. And then they've also shown that if you knock out MIR4, um, that you also abrogate the capacity to form the tumour. So when I say MIR Marrick's disease, that's what I'm talking about. And then they also have shown that if they switch in the uh, chicken version of MIR55, or that you actually restore the, the capacity to form those tumours. So when this what we've been working on for many, many years now is can we actually make a better uh, Marrick's disease vaccine in terms of if we need that generation four vaccine, uh, what would that look like? So from my perspective, a perfect Marrick's disease vaccine would prevent tumour formation because people don't like getting chickens with tumours in them. But then critically, it would also have to prevent virus replication at the feather follicle. So we could stop that cycle, that vicious cycle of transmission um, of the virus. Then, so how might we do that? So what we decided to work on many years ago now is, is can we actually target the virus using RNA interference? And now most people would understand the concept of RNA interference now, I would hope. But what it would enable us to do is actually facilitate the targeting of two virus transcripts and therefore interrupt this replication of the feather follicle uh, and produce what we might describe as the perfect vaccine um, for, for Marrick's disease. Importantly, RNAi enables us to actually target structural um, genes of the virus. So structural, one, structural ones are those that we might think about are included in conventional type vaccines, even in mRNA vaccines. So those, um, genes that encode proteins that interact with our immune system, but also the non-structural parts of the virus. So those um, enzymes and, and things that are involved in the virus replication process, but we can't generally target using conventional vaccination. So it's been shown that RNA interference works very well in, in plants in particular, uh, and, but it's actually a little bit more difficult in vertebrate species. Species. And the main reason for that is one of the precursors um, for using RNA interference is actually the use or develop or expression of double stranded RNA. Now, in most in mammals the, and birds, the expression or the presence of dsRNA in cells triggers a very strong innate immune response because it's considered that that's um, strongly associated with viral infections, the cell seizes as a clear and present danger, and then typically will induce a very strong immune response um, that properly leads, it, leads into cell death. To get away from that invertebrate species, we use this process called DNA-directed RNA interference, where we actually provide a template to produce the dsRNA, um, not deliver it to the cells. So you can see here on the right that that can either be done by a virus, so we can deliver the DSR, the construct 
that expresses the RNA interference double stranded RNA, or we can just deliver it via a plasmid. When that enters the cell nucleus, it produces the double stranded RNA, but it gets processed into smaller uh, fragments before it gets exposed to the elements of the cell that might trigger this danger response. And unfortunately, in, in animals, we also have the issue that. Uh, there's no systemic response. So in plants, if you introduce RNA interference in some parts of the plant, it will actually go systemic and also works in crustaceans as well. Uh, and so therefore you can deliver it to one part of the animal or organism and have an effect with the other part. Whereas in invertebrate species, it only really works in the cell where you've delivered it. And as a consequence, um, delivery is a real problem for RNAi in, in mammals and other vertebrates. Uh, and there's no persistence of the response. But what of that, by that I mean is that if the target for that RNAi is not there, then those effector molecules essentially disappear. But we would argue that Marrick's disease is a perfect model for RNAi uh, applications in um, animals. And the reason for that is that the vaccine virus follows the same pathway to the filler follicle as the virus that causes the disease. And the RNA, and so by adding an RNA, RNA interference um, expression cassettes into our vaccine strain, we would retain the immunological base protection provided by general vaccination. But the RNA interference would allow us to reduce further or prevent, even prevent replication of the feather follicle and therefore transmission or excretion into the production environment. And on my cartoon on the right here, you can see of that. So in green, we have our vaccine strain. So birds have been vaccinated and the virus has undergone those processes. It might be HPT. It's moved into the feather follicle and been shed. Uh, the, bar, the bird's also been challenged with a wild type strain. Similarly, it undergoes the same processes, ends up at the feather follicle being shed. But in some areas of the bird, we have co-infection with both the vaccine and wild type strain. In that case, we will actually interrupt this replication and shedding at the feather follicle. So we think that would enable sustainable control of those diseases. So how do we do that? As I said before, viruses are closely related, but genetically distinct. Um, so we have analyzed the various virus genes, and you can see here an alignment of DNA polymerase, so probably, arguably, the most critical gene in, within the herpes virus family, because it enables uh, replication of the genome. And you can see there that there are distinct areas that within this gene uh, that, uh, that delineate between the viruses. So if we wanted to target NDV1, then this region here would be particularly useful if we're using a HPT vector, uh, because this sequence is completely absent um, from, that, from our vector virus. So how do we get that in there? So in my lab, we've worked on infectious clones for herpes viruses. And this is a process whereby we make a copy of the virus, which is maintained in bacteria. And the reason we do this is, well, the number of reasons for that. So it facilitates precise manipulation and engineering the bacteria. And it allows us to examine in that enables us to examine gene to do gene function studies. So in traditional approaches for this, we would knock out a gene. If we don't see replication, then we assume that that virus, that gene is essential for virus replication. And if we do, then it's not. Whereas uh, here we can actually create that gene, that genome that doesn't contain that, bar, that gene of interest, and then transfect that in. So we can actually, it works as a very good control system. It also enables our vaccine strain to be clonal and stable, so it's very stably um, uh, produced in the bacteria. So we went through this process, and this process was done um, by Professor Nina Mitter back in the day, and we produced uh, five infectious clones through this process. And you can see here, so this is an example from uh, what we might get out of that experiment. You can see here this complex, these complex restriction enzyme patterns and what we might expect from a complete clone, whereas these other ones um, have come through the process but don't contain all the elements required for the virus. When we analyze these clones in um, 
in cell culture, they look identical to the wild type. And then we inserted um, the DDRNAI constructs um, for that. And then with collaboration with Steve Walker and Brown's group at UNE, um, tested these in birds. And so what we did was they were birds were vaccinated, and then they were challenged with an Australian strain of uh, MDD1 called Woodlands. And you can see here the result. So initially we were quite disappointed with this because you can see here, this is wild type HVT, quite a good protection. Um, our parental HVT bat clone, not so much. But importantly, when we add the DDRNAI, they look more like wild type. When we take that out, we can clearly see that adding in the DDRNAI constructs are having an effect on the virus replication. So, um, Going through this experiment, we were able to show that throughout that experiment that um, the DDRNAI constructs were able to, um, to provide good or actually reduce the amount of, of virulent virus that was produced. So we didn't continue this experiment through to the production of tumors uh, for ethical reasons. We didn't think that was required at the time in a proof of concept study. Uh, and Questions that remain are what would happen if we started adding multiple DDRNA constructs into one vaccine vector? Would we actually increase this impact on virus replication? Um, and then also our other part of interest was if we were able to um, restore our wild type replication phenotype. In the analysis of our HVT clones, we discovered some interesting things. As I said before, when we looked at them in vitro, there was no difference between our clones and the wild type, um, except for one of them, which was severely attenuated. But then when we did the, did the chicken vaccination experiment, we were able to see very clear differences, or significant differences between the in vivo replication capacity of our clones compared to our wild type. We then went on to complete do complete genome sequencing for these, and we discovered that they were there was multiple deletions within these clones. Um, so you can see here, you know, uh, deletions one, two, three, one, two, three, from there. Uh, and then what we discovered then was that in one of these, particularly genomic deletion one, uh, they were all lacking the glycoprotein C gene, uh, which is non essential in some herpes virus, so we wouldn't expect that to impact. But there was a published study for MDV1 where they showed that MDV, the GC, the GC uh, negatively replicates, uh, never negatively uh, regulates replication in vitro, so in cell culture, um, but it's actually a positive uh, in vitro. So we suspect that in vivo, sorry. So we suspect this uh, attenuation is due to the loss of GC. So, some colleagues of ours in, in the UK were able to complete a similar experiment with different targets using HPT and DDRNAI. So we have that um, proof of concept as well. Uh, so the next steps in this would be to re engineer our HPT to get that wild type replication capacity uh, and then um, we'll move on from there. Uh, interruption running out of work. So we get to this concept of an imperfect vaccine. And so in thinking about that, the question comes up, well, what's a perfect vaccine? Does it prevent infection and not and that prevents infection so you don't get disease? Um, does not prevent infection, but prevents clinical disease? So that's probably where Marek's disease sits. Or does it prevent infection, but reduces the risk of severe disease? And so that may be where our COVID uh, vaccine sits. So it all depends on your perspective. And we probably don't have time to get that. The diagram there, if we were in an audience, I'd ask everybody to put up their hand if they thought that A and B were the same color. Uh, and I suspect that most people would say they're not. If you get the time, um, print this out, and they're actually, they are actually the same color, but because of that shading and the perspective, they actually appear to be different. So Marek's disease vaccines to date have controlled disease, but imperfectly. The continuous, this continuous cycle of vaccination and infection um, enables the virus to create an adversity, and that adversity uh, then has that potential to overcome the protective 
effects of macromarxism. Because I said before, the core activity of Marx's advice is not tumors, it's infection, replication, infection, replication, and shedding. And that's what our vaccines are made So the group in, in the UK, led by Andrew Reid, they looked at well, what's the impact of this imperfect vaccination in, in the context of highly virulent pathogens and the serotonin uh, viruses. And what they showed was that the vaccine was actually able to facilitate transmission of these very virulent viruses. Um, and the, but the key reason for that was that if birds got a very virulent virus without vaccination, they actually died before they uh, were able to transmit virus. So, and so it's not actually in a demonstration of increase in virulence, it's just a demonstration of the potential benefits of vaccination versus the potential downside. And interestingly, this published, you can see that study was published in 2015, uh, and Andrew wrote a, a piece for the conversation, which you might want to have a look at uh, in August 2021, so a couple of months ago. It's had 370,000 views at that stage, which now up. 450,000 views, but 70% of those views have been in the last couple of months. So, and that it's been championed by some of the parts of society, let's call them, uh, in the context of the value of COVID 19 vaccines. Not very uh, well, I might add. But as Andrew points out, there's actually very few examples of vaccines driving change. And his works clearly show that there's actually a benefit to vaccination. And this is some of the experimental work which I don't really have time now to go into. But I guess what the, the take home message is here is that here on, your, on the right, on the left, sorry, we have the least virulent viruses. And so these viruses, uh, when they're vaccinated, all the birds survive. And then so the unvaccinated all, all the birds survive and we get shedding into the production environment. But when we move across to the far right, we have, if you're not vaccinated, then you actually die before you have the opportunity um, to shed virus into the environment. And so uh, one of the consequences of that is that here we'll see that um, with vaccination, there's actually more of this virus uh, released into the production environment. And this group also, in the same study, they also went on to show that, um, that vaccination actually suppressed the wild or the highly virulent virus, highly virulent viruses, about 100 times quicker, um, to the point where they could actually, if they weren't vaccinated, again, there was no um, shedding or no transmission of that virus to so what happens if we were to compare COVID-19 COVID virus with Maris? Well, it's not quite comparing apples with apples. So yes, both are envelope viruses, but MDV is highly resistant to the virus. And whereas SARS-CoV-2 is not that resistant to the environment. So it's readily inactivated by common detergents, uh, exposure to UV light, those sorts of things, whereas MDV1 is not. In terms of their genome, so MDV1, as I said before, is a large DNA genome, but it's actually quite variable for a DNA virus. Uh, and whereas SARS-CoV-2 with its RNA genome, the coronaviruses are actually relatively stable for RNA viruses. You can see here, uh, in this diagram, that we our herp, our double stranded viruses are on the more stable side of things. Uh, and the SARS and group of viruses sit close, like relatively close to that. And that's because they're one of the RNA virus, rare examples of RNA viruses with the capacity uh, for uh, genome proofreading, proofreading in the replication cycle. They both infect via the respiratory system. However, as I mentioned before, MDV1 is inhaled as particles, which are then engulfed by macrophages, and that is only after that encoding process do they then become 
uh, exposed to the immune system. Whereas SARS-CoV, the SARS virus is actually, the two virus is actually more classical virus in that it interacts with the epithelial cells of the recruiting tract. And so there is that opportunity for inflammation. So for vaccination and transmission, MDV1 vaccines, as we talked about today, they prevent disease, they impact on replication and transmission, but they lead to accumulation uh, in, this, in the environment. Whereas with our SARS CoV 2 vaccine, they certainly re reduce the risk of severe disease, they reduce replication and shedding, and the risk of transmission to others. So, in conclusion, uh, the future emergence of more virulent strains will it occur? I guess we don't know. According to the Witter model, we've been waiting for that virus or those viruses to emerge, and they haven't uh, emerged in the past 25 years. But the vaccines that with a DDR and AI based interference, is a good insurance policy. So we'll be ready for that virus. The other option will be to make transgenic birds. And a colleague of mine, Tim Durham in Geelong, so they've actually made those birds and then used some of those viruses. We use the woodland strain um, to challenge those birds, but I don't know the outcome of that study yet. There's also the de-evolution of the poultry industry. So this move back towards uh, free range, will that actually help interrupt this uh, the transmission cycles of um, MDV, we don't know yet. But as Pat Blackwell would say, it actually means we're actually seeing a reemergence of some old diseases that weren't, um, uh, that we'd lost in that intensification process. So I guess I would contend to contradict my title in that parasitic is probably a not, not a good model for other diseases in terms of um, the impacts of vaccination. As I hope you've got at least one thing in the talk that there's several unique features um, of this virus compared to other virus associated diseases. But I think that what they all do have in common is that when we deploy the, any vaccine, it requires vigilance. So understanding what the vaccine, what we want the vaccine to achieve in the host, understanding what the impact of the vaccine is on the pathogen. So is it sterile immunity? Is it just interrupting replication? and then understanding what the response of the pathogen is to that. So in that rather complicated diagram to the right, you can see what the impact is of various of these, all these interactions uh, without vaccine overlay. So for example, we take, so this was uh, late last year, so we don't know what, yet what the impact of SARS-CoV-2 um, will be, but it depends on the effectiveness effectiveness of your vaccines, the transmission rates, uh, all these sorts of things are going to feed into how effective your vaccine is. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge, um, these are all the people that have been involved in various aspects um, of this project, which is, as I said, this body of work uh, has gone on for quite a long time now. And some of the work that I've described today was funded um, during the public CIC day. Now, I'm not going to be a proponent for or against vaccination. I'll just leave you to have a quick look at this diagram. And you make your own decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim, for the excellent talk. Do we have, do you have time for questions? I could entertain one question. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to run to my meeting and then I'll probably end up in emergency. <laughs> That's all right. I, uh, I have a quick question for you. Uh, do you think we could use the HVT vector for any other poultry diseases? Yeah, I think it has that capacity. I think the key thing is that uh, is what's the overlap with the other targets? So the logical things would be things like avian influenza, uh, those sorts of things. But if we don't get that overlap between where the HVT and the RNAi effectors are and where the virus is, then it's not going to work. And I think that's that's the big limitation that we have in invertebrates, same uh, gene therapy, really great process, but delivering the work needs to be when it has to be all the time. Thank you. Uh, so I guess we this should be it for today's session. Oh, hang on, Pat's got a question. Yeah, he has. <laughs> um. Um, so the answer to that question, so Pat's just asked a question about 
currently in Australia, anyway, the Marisol is, is quite effectively controlled with the current vaccines. And so does the poultry industry have any interest in supporting the development of new generation vaccines? Um, I would have to say the answer to that is currently no. So we were able to get the work funded that I've described today, um, several years ago. But as we, it seems to be as we move further away um, from when RISPINS was first instigated and Bob Witter's model tends to that time frame between the emergence of the new viruses is getting longer and longer. And I think people might be taking that as well, it's never going to happen. Now, whether that's the case or not, I don't know. And then, of course, industries need to balance their clear and present dangers versus their emerging dangers. So I guess we'll, uh, the short answer is no, thanks. <laughs> no, we'll have to go. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, don't forget next week's seminar. Uh, I think Professor uh, Bob Gilbert is talking next week, Tuesday, 16th of November. So I think next week's session is going to be a hybrid one. So we don't have the details yet but they, uh, they, wish they should come in your mailbox soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.